All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the League Express podcast. My name's Jake Keenan, and joining me as always is the editor of League Express, Martin Sadler. And Martin, another weekend full of rugby league. Uh, what matches did you enjoy, and did you get to watch them all? Well, I didn't, I didn't watch them all, no. There's far too many far too many to watch with all these games now on TV. But, um, no, I particularly, of course, enjoyed watching the Warrington League game, which, yeah. um, which I thought was a magnificent game, and... Uh, Warrington just just edged it, didn't they? But mm. I mean, Lee are just in such a false position, in mm. my view, at the bottom of the table um, or near the bottom of the table. They they've only got two points from their games so far, but they've played all the top sides mm. apart from when they had that very easy win at Hull. Yeah. So they've still got to play Castleford and they've still got to play London. So I think things will clarify after they've played those teams, but. Uh, you know, at the at the moment, they're playing well above their, what their league position suggests they should be doing. Mm. By the way, while we're here, happy St George's Day to you! It's April the twenty third. It's uh, the the national day for English people. Most of us tend to forget about St George's Day day these days, but um, you know, it's um, we ought to send our best wishes to everybody called George who plays <laughs> rugby league, shouldn't we? Yep. Uh, George Williams, perhaps yep. George Lawler, who we had a. An article about in League Express this week, the Castleford player who had that very unfortunate seizure but seems to be, I'm very glad to say, on the mend. Mm. Uh, although, um, uh, as Craig Lingard told us, you can't drive a car for six months after having that sort of um, health scare happening to him. Mm. But hopefully I'd, I'd love nothing more than to see George back playing for Castleford at at some point in the future, it's a bit early to say when that will be, mm. but uh, we send our best wishes to him for a you know continuing recovery, and uh, you know hopefully we'll uh, you know see him um, back in a Castle- Castleford shirt before too long. No, definitely, those things take time, and you and you really do, do want to take your time with it. And they do. People often uh, say how many uh, you know minor car crashes happen in a rugby league match. You know, that impact. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, take your time with that recovery, George, and we can't wait to see you back Absolutely. on the pitch. The other big day this week, it's Anzac Day, isn't it? The, That's right. the big day for Australians. Yes. Where you, where you, you know, commemorate the Anzac forces uh, during the wartime period, and uh, <clears throat> in particular what happened at Gallipoli. So there are three big NRL games on Thursday this week to uh, to celebrate Anzac Day, and they're always very notable occasions, aren't mm. they? They always, you know, you always have... Um, you know, a, a lot of um, events occurring at these games that suggest what you know, or that pay tribute to all those uh, Anzac soldiers who who sacrificed their lives in the war, and mm. it's very moving, I think. No, oh, definitely, and that is the one of the games in the rugby league calendar that fans and clubs circle and and look forward to, and it's the match that teams that are participating they don't want to lose that match. No, um, exactly, no, and they do tend to be quite. Uh, tightly contested um, battles, but um, yeah, it's it's also the one of the uh, very few days in the year that everyone in Australia and New Zealand uh, celebrates and gets behind. And, Absolutely, um, yes. yeah. It's uh, I'm really looking forward to it. It's a mm. I'm a little bit disappointed that um, you know we sort of talked about before the podcast Storm aren't playing the Warriors. That's no, they normally do, matchup. but this year the, the the Warriors wanted a home game in in Auckland and they're playing the Gold Coast. Mm. And they've sold it out. You know, they've sold out every game this season of the Warriors at uh, at their stadium, and it's great to see. Um, and it'll, I'm sure it'll be a terrific event. Three games on um, on on Thursday. Unfortunately, only one of them is on <coughs> Sky Sports over here, mm. uh, which I think is the third game, the Melbourne versus um, who are they playing this year? Oh, South Sydney, it is, mm. isn't it? Yeah, mm. South Sydney. But uh, it'll be great to see that and. Uh, and and to see you know the other games too. Mm. Well, before we get into uh, last weekend's matchups, Martin, we will remind our viewers and listeners uh, if you are watching on YouTube, hit subscribe. We're uh, sort of approaching nine hundred subscribers now. I believe really? was yes. the last uh, yeah. total I saw. So that's should, the next target, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, hopefully yeah. in the next week or so we can click over nine hundred. Yes, That'd be great. It would be nice. And we do have League Express on the table here as well as well as the Rugby League World magazine. So if anyone wants to grab their uh, subscriptions to that, head along to totalrl.com forward slash shop or uh, most Absolutely. news agencies across the north. And just a final point before we start, somebody on the um, on, on YouTube this last week said, why doesn't Martin Sadler wear a different pullover? <laughs> I don't know whether you noticed that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I actually do wear different that. pullovers, but they all, they all look quite similar. They're all dark and they're all of a similar style. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, what's funny about that is that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping 
that at some stage, Jake, I won't need to wear a pullover because it'll be warm enough not to. That's right. But at the moment, it's been such a cold year so far that I've I've kept wearing these blasted pullovers. And, uh, you know, the first time that I, you know, don't, um, you'll see me not wearing one on one of these podcasts, you know, I'd be... I'd be. Uh, I'll. I'll. I'll buy you a drink. You know, to 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 celebrate. <laughs> oh, mate, we look forward to. It. And you know, we uh, we're comfort over style here. Uh, you and I. Aren't, oh, aren't we're the, not. The we're not style icons, are we? Yeah, that's no, right. No, no. So, um, no. I've been guilty of wearing uh, my pullover, and it's just because it's nice. It's a. It's a good sort of medium between, um, you know, being too warm or, or mm. too cool. Just nice material. Well, as a Queenslander, you probably need to wear a pullover throughout the year because, (laughs) you know, it's so cold here compared to Queensland. Yeah, I think uh, I'm looking forward to just being able to walk outside and wear a hoodie rather than my big puffer jacket I've got behind me here. But yeah, yeah, anyway, mate, we'll get into uh, this weekend's matchups. That's enough talk about style for now. Um, We'll start with the uh, Wigan Cass game. Wigan 36 defeated Cass 14. A much improved performance for Cass from the week before. It was, yes, it was. Um, I've, I, it's not a game that I've um, seen and, and watched very closely, but um, Cass showing some improvement, and that's really good to see, I think. Um, I mean, in fact, they were in the game in the first half. It was only in the second half that Wigan ran away with it. Bevan French <coughs> scored a great try and had a, a, a very strong game. Mm. Um, but... I mean, obviously, it was an expected result. I predicted that Wigan might win by about 40 points. They didn't do that. Mm. But, um, you know, it's um, a a big result for Castleford. And I think Castleford are slowly improving. Obviously, in the Challenge Cup, they got hammered by Wigan. Um, But maybe the Challenge Cup wasn't their firm focus this year. Um, So it's going to be interesting to see whether they can still, you know, carry on getting better. They've... They've um, done a, a swap deal. Jack Broadbent leaving Castleford to go to Hull KR. Yeah. Um, and um, Corey Hall coming from Hull KR to Castleford. Yeah. Um, obviously, Lewis Senior came to Castleford last week and scored a try against Wigan on, on the weekend. So they are making some adjustments to their squad, and hopefully that will all work out and um, it will lead to much better results in the future. Mm, no, definitely. And uh, one of the things there that a few fans have been pointing out is uh, Broadbent's leaving and then he's going to sign a, a new deal with Hull KR for a mm. further two or three years, I believe, till the end of 2027, I think the figure is. Um, but, yes, unfortunately for uh, Cass... Um, and get those players for the remainder of the season. Well, um, I'm sure they'll have the, the you know the potential to sign them for longer if they um, perform well at Castleford. But it's quite interesting. Jack Broadbent, interesting player. I actually, I I used to think he was a really promising player at Leeds, but for some, and I was surprised when Leeds let him go to Castleford. Um, and maybe Willie Peters has seen in Jack Broadbent what I saw in him. I suppose you might say. Um, you know, as a potential very good player. And Corey Hall, interesting, they're letting Corey Hall go to Castleford. Because, again, Corey Hall is another who came through the Leeds system and then went to Wakefield and, 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 and looked very good for Wakefield mm-hmm. um, when he played for them, but but hasn't quite managed to crack a regular spot at, um, at Hull KR. You know, and obviously Hull KR have got a, a very strong side. So, mm-hmm. you know, and, and opportunities just haven't fallen for him there. Um, so maybe they will do it uh, at Castleford and we'll see what he's really made of, I think. Mm. Well, if there's any uh, club where he's going to get a chance, Castleford's probably the right place. You'd imagine so, so, wouldn't you? Yeah, uh, it'd be a good mm. opportunity for him to showcase his talent uh, and yeah. what he can do. Uh, we'll move on to the next match. We had Huddersfield 30, defeated Leeds 24 in a, uh, a come-from-behind uh, win for Huddersfield. It was a little bit back and forth there in the second half. Huddersfield, I mean, it, it, it's really interesting to see Huddersfield, isn't it? Things, you know, they are starting to show what, you know, to achieve some of their potential, let's put it that way. Mm. Not dissimilar to Warrington, really, in uh, in a sense. It's going to be an interesting Challenge Cup semi-final when those two clubs meet. But, you know, they had that massive win <coughs> in Perpignan against Catalans in the Challenge Cup. And I thought they were always stronger than um, Leeds on Friday night at Headingley. Mm. Um, obviously, they've got players who are in form at the moment. Obviously, Jake Connor, mm. Adam Swift, um, again on, on, on the wing, looks looks great. And, you know, we, we've, we've got a, by the way, a reader's poll in League Express this week about who should be picked on the left wing for England right. when they play France in June. 
and Adam Swift is one of six players who we've picked out. You can go on to totalrl.com to cast a vote in that poll, and it's quite close at the moment, apparently. So, you know, if you um, like Swift or any of the other guys who were mentioned there, just just go on and, and, and cast your vote. And um, But I thought, no, I thought it was uh, a really strong performance by, by Huddersfield. They, they were behind by 12 points on two separate occasions in that game, but came back both times. And um, and we're lucky in the end, actually, to get that final try. And I think um, Phil Bentham of the RFL, the match officials director, has now made it clear that, that their last try shouldn't have been allowed, actually, because yeah. the uh, scorer, um, I think it was Adam Clune, wasn't it, um, knocked the ball on before... Picking, you know, it, it, it's one of those situations where the ball bobbled between players, mm. but it actually was definitely a touch before he sped away to, uh, to 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 score. So, but even so, they'd have still won twenty six twenty four, mm. and of course we had that incredible decision um, by Lucky Miller to drop out from under his own post with just a few minutes to go. It was twenty four all, mm. and he dropped out short, and it didn't go the ten meters. Yeah. And it was a penalty to Huddersfield in front of the posts, and it was one of the few goals that Jake Connor kicked actually on Friday night. <laughs> but you know he couldn't miss it really. Could even I could have kicked that one. Yeah, um, and that secured the win for them. And you know th- this obsession. I mean, we saw a few weeks ago, didn't we, with um, Mark Sneed doing a similar thing and you know dropping out from under a post, mm. short drop out, and you know Wigan got the ball and and touched it down for for the winning try. Mm. Um, I can't understand the logic very often in in short dropouts. You know, you, you particularly when it's a very tight game. You're under your own posts. You're giving the opposition a chance to score um, with not much time to go. Why do it? What what's the logic in it? I, it just mm. I'm I'm just amazed, really. Yeah, it's one of those things that if you are going to do it, do it uh, on a regular basis. You've got to be practicing that every single week. Oh, you've got to and... be spot on. You, mm. you know, you've you've really got to. And it's not just the kicker who's got to be spot on; it's the players waiting for the ball to land mm. to make sure. Because if particularly if you do it under, from under your own posts, there's that chance that even if it goes ten meters, you're going to put it into the hands of the opposition, and they're going to storm over as as mm. as, as, as Wigan did against Salford a few weeks ago. So it's crazy. One other thing in that game, by the way, the Leeds-Castleford game, that I picked up on, and I don't think anybody else has mentioned it, but when Leeds scored their second try to to go 12-0 ahead, there was a very interesting situation where uh, there was a play the ball, Leeds were playing the ball, and the ball went to um, Rhys Martin. And as he tried to break the line, um, Leroy Kudjo was going to tackle him. And the referee, Chris Kendall, yelled out, Leroy, you're not square. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that, if you saw it on TV. Mm. But it said, Leroy, you're not square. So just as Leroy was going to tackle him, he obviously heard that call from Chris Kendall and sort of didn't complete the tackle. And it allowed Reese Martin to burst through the Huddersfield defence. He got tackled, you know, probably about... 10 or 15 metres from the Leeds line. And in the next tackle, Brody Croft put the kick in that led to Paul Momorowski scoring. Mm. But, you know, I, I, I do think this thing about referees coaching players on the field and telling them... I mean, if, if Leroy Kudjo was not square at the play of the ball, he should have been penalised. Mm. And, you know, and who knows whether the Leeds would have scored after that. But, but you know, it, 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 it clearly... <clears throat> interrupted the flow of the game because Leroy, Leroy would have tackled Reese Martin if 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 he'd not heard that you know call from Chris Kendall, but he didn't. He actually let him go through, and that directly impacted the way it, you know it led up to the next Leeds try. So I, I I just think sometimes referees instead of yelling to players you're offside or you're not square, just penalise them. Mm. That's what you're supposed to do, in my view, and uh, I wish they would do that. Mm. He must have saw there was a bit of a clear advantage there for, um, I guess, Reese Martin. Oh, well, Reese Martin, yeah. I mean, mm. a clear advantage, yeah. Mm. And, yeah. Uh, 
and took advantage of it. And good, mm. you know, good luck to him. He did mm. the right thing. But mm. you know, as I say, it, it 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 wasn't right in my eyes. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, yeah, you touched on it there, Jake Connor. It's probably the only thing we can say about him negatively was his goal kicking. The scoreline could have been a bit bigger. The South Stand really loved his goal kicking, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Every time he missed one, they. Um, they they sort of took the mick out of him really, and yep. uh, but he had the last laugh, you know. Mm, that's right. Jake Connor had the last laugh, and uh, good on him. Mm. Now, just another thing related to uh, leads that I saw over the past week or so. I think uh, the Courier Mail over in Australia did a uh, interview with Brody Croft's manager, and there's a few things he said about Brody Croft that I kind of disagreed with uh, in the article. He was telling a few lies. Um, one of the things he said was that. Um, Brody Croft, um, he's you know always been linked to NRL clubs and, and attracting interest. But mm. uh, his manager went on to say that um, you know he's he's in the hunt for another Man of Steel this year. Um, could very well win it again. But he's sitting fifteenth in the standings at the moment. Well, with three yeah. points. I mean, you never know, do you? you yeah. Never know, but I mean, yeah, he could have it, a late charge back. But managers talk the players up, don't they? Let's <laughs> yeah. face it, a, a bit of hyperbole at times. Yeah, that's doesn't, right. Doesn't do them too much harm, I don't suppose. Um, I think he said something uh, along the the words of um, you know he's carving up. Uh, the Super League this year and, and not, Leeds are doing very well and I'm quite. like yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if he's I, watching the same games I don't think will fool anybody right by saying that if I'm really honest about no, it but no. odd, odd that he should he should do that yeah. but, yeah. but, I mean, but there, is, there is as you said there is a lot of talk linking Brody to a return to the NRL whether that, that will happen mm. one day in the near future who knows, really? But um, I, I get the feeling that Brody's quite happy playing in Super League. But, you know, who, who knows? It, obviously, he is an Australian. So hmm. there will be a homing instinct there in, in some shape or form. But we'll just have to see how that works out. Yeah. And I guess there's plenty of time left in the season. He might have a uh, historic run home. Oh, well, you uh, never know. Yeah. And yeah. they go on to win Man of Steel. But, but they need to start making an impression to Leeds, don't they? Because they've, hmm. you know, they've played, played eight, won four, lost four. Which you know isn't it's not good, but it's not bad in in a sense. But they need to start doing better than they are. Mm. They're a team. If you are a betting man, you probably don't want to touch. You just don't know what you're going to get. We no, 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 out. no. They are unpredictable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll move on to the next match. I was at this one, mate. The uh, Saints fifty eight defeated Hull FC zero. Uh, have you watched? No, I've not. Wa- I've not watched that one in detail either. Not not yet. Just seen the highlights. But mm. my goodness, the, the, all the highlights were some talent highlights, weren't they? And yeah. Uh, and it it was, uh, I mean, it's so sad to see Hull conceding so many fifty point scores. And I know, I mean, you you wrote a a very kind um, match report um, in which you sort of said, you know, the whole youngsters did well, and young Logan Moy, I think his name mm. is, the young fullback, did particularly well. And and uh, you know, that's great to see. But they just need some cattle in the middle of the field, don't mm. they? Hull? They they. They need some forwards who can take on the opposition and and quieten them down, really. And mm. they've, they've just not got that at the moment. And uh, you just wonder what's what's you know what's what's going to happen, who they're going to recruit to um, to sort that out, and so on. And you know they're on a hiding to nothing every week at the moment. Mm. Yeah, it's um, one of those matches where you know it was actually quite tightly contested in the first 15 to 20 minutes or so. Um, I did mention that, you know, the youngsters showed a lot of effort. It was nice to see a bit of pride back in that black and white jersey, um, but a tough ask, um, you know, for for um, Simon Griggs to come in and have to come up against the Saints side that is mm. looking to rebound after that uh, disappointing uh, performance yeah, the week yeah. before. Yeah. It was, and the St. Helens side uh, was vastly different. No Daryl Clark, uh, no mm. Lewis Dodd. So there was a bit of a shuffle there in that lineup. But Saints just you know, showing off, showing off their depth really. Yeah. Um, and you know they needed a big win and, and they got it. So yeah, yeah, disappointing uh, for Hull FC. But you know. We can pretty much write this year off for them. It's a rebuilding phase they're in now. You can, and, and of course they're being linked now with um, Paul Rowley, the mm. Salford coach. And they, I, I mean, people are saying they've made him an offer. Mm. Um, would Paul Rowley be wise to go there, though? That's mm. the big question, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we'll um, yeah, we'll get into that a little bit later, okay. and um, okay. some of the other uh, news around the league. But we'll stick with uh, the next matchup: Warrington sixteen defeated Lee fourteen. Uh, uh, a tightly contested battle thoroughly, enjo- thoroughly enjoyable game. Mm. And um, as I said a bit earlier, I, I, I feel a bit sorry for Lee that their you know, performances are not uh, being reflected in their results. And 
I mean, it goes back, doesn't it? To a lot of coaches say they're more interested in performance than results. Mm. But I'm not sure whether Adrian Lamb would agree with that at the moment mm. because they could do with some results. And um, I'm sure that at, at some point soon they'll start getting some. But, you know, it's got to start, you know, it's it's got to come fairly quickly. They've, they're now, I mean, they've, they've, they've played seven games of Lee, haven't they? They've played one less than um, all the other teams apart from Wigan. Mm. Um, but they're now eight points behind the top six, and that's a very, very big gap to um, to try and catch up on. So, you know, and, and of course this weekend they play... I mean, as, as I say, they've, they've had some really tough fixtures, and this weekend it doesn't get much easier because they play the Catalans Dragons at home. Mm. You know, when are they going to play some of the teams that... Are, Maybe a bit less less competitive. Who knows? Yeah, yeah they. Uh, they you know we'll have to check the fixture list, won't we? Yeah, they definitely uh, drew. Got a tough draw this year, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, really good match up that one, and I'm sure uh, a win is just around the corner for Lee. Fingers crossed. Uh, but yeah, we'll move on to the next match up, a close one. Uh, Salford twelve defeated London four. A lot of fight showed by. Uh, London. Yes, this is another game that I have seen, and <clears throat> I mean I enjoy watching London Broncos. Oddly enough, you know, I mean I know they struggle, but. Um, they play with enormous enthusiasm, and um, you know I, I, I like watching their halfback combination, Jamie Meadows, and um, and obviously there's Ollie Leyland there, who's who, who I think is is a very promising player, and um, you know they, they they're not completely, you know they're not a hopeless basket case, I, I don't think, and Salford really struggled to beat them, um, but did did so in the end, you know by an eight point margin, which was probably a lot less than most people predicted. But I think Salford will be quite relieved to get over that game because the, the thing about the Broncos, <clears throat> one of the reasons they've been conceding so many points this year is that their pack has been steamrolled very often by the opposition. A lot of a lot of teams, you know, the Wiggins and the Saints, are so strong in the middle. They've got such a physical dominance that they can just motor through the uh, London Broncos pack. But the Salford Red Devils play a different sort of game. They play a game that's much more, you know, wide-ranging, round, round, round the pitch, giving it to the outside backs and so on. <clears throat> they don't, you know, Salford haven't got the strength in the middle to steamroll teams such as, you know, the other teams near the top. So that worked to London's advantage, and it was actually a very enjoyable game to watch mm. uh, in the end. But um, London just couldn't quite manage manage it to get the win. So, uh, but good game to watch, and you know, I, I still think it's worth going to games at the Cherry Red Record Stadium in Wimbledon um, mm. if you get the chance, uh, Jake. Yeah, yeah, because as I say, on TV the stadium looks uh, great. You know. It's perfect looks for what neat. they need. Yeah, um, perfect. But very neat. Just nine thousand or so capacity, and yeah. you know that's that's great. And uh, it it certainly looks looks good. It, it would just be nice to see a few more people in there, wouldn't it? Mm. No, I believe they are working hard to get those fans and, and attract him with different offers. So, oh yeah, um, yeah. Fingers crossed, we can get some more fans down there in London. Uh, but we'll move on to the final matchup of the round. Uh, Catalan thirty six uh, defeated Hull KR six. Um, Bigger margin than I expected in this one. <coughs> yes, but Mikey Lewis wasn't playing for Hull KR, was he? That's and right. so, so, you know, there are quite a lot of teams uh, in in Super League who, 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 whose play revolves around one particular player, mm. and if you take that player out, it suddenly becomes much more difficult for them. And I think Mikey Lewis is one such player um, for for Hull KR. And take him out. I mean, they had. Ben Reynolds um, partnering Tyrone May at halfback, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, you know the, the 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 Dragons were very determined to bounce back from that shocking Challenge Cup defeat by Huddersfield, and and they did so and did so very well. And you know it was it was good to see them hitting form again. But um, it was always once Michael Lewis was out, I thought this would be a you know really difficult game for Holcow, mm. and it turned out to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Ben Reynolds. Back, uh, I thought he played league. well. He didn't yeah. let anybody down, but you know, it it just wasn't quite the same. They didn't have that sort of the thing. The thing about Michael Lewis, he puts uncertainty uncertainty into the opposition mm. when he gets the ball. He's one of those guys, and nobody's quite sure 
what they're going to do is they're going to run with it, kick it. What's he going to do? Is how's he going to take them on? Mm. And you know, hopefully he won't be out for very long. Mm. He's one of those players that you know that whenever or wherever he went as a young youngster, um, he always had a, a football or rugby league ball in his oh, hands. Yeah. You can just tell he's he played a lot that of sort of kid, doesn't he? Yeah, we a call very, like, very very enthusiastic player. And some things he does, you just think, oh, that's something you know he's done in his front yard Absolutely. or you know, yeah, out down at the park on a weekend as mm. a youngster. So, um, yeah, really exciting player and. Um, yeah, going to be the face of the game Absolutely. in many years to come. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll move on to the biggest news story of the past uh, 48 hours or so, or 24 hours, we could say. Uh, we touched on it earlier. Uh, Hull FC reportedly going after uh, the Salford coach, Paul Rowley. Uh, one of the, the transfer fee that's being reported, uh, £150,000 uh, transfer fee, um, what impact do you think he could make at Hull FC and do you think uh, it'd be wise for him to leave uh, Salford Well, for let's Hull? think about the latter point first. Would it be wise for him to leave Salford to go to Hull, particularly in mid-season? Mm, no. My answer to that is no, it no. wouldn't be. But, I mean, oddly enough, today, um, we, we mentioned earlier, uh, Jake, that today is St George's Day, but it's also William Shakespeare's birthday, the great playwright, 460 years since he was born, mm. and one of his fav- one of his most famous quotes is one that will be going through Paul Rowley's mind at the moment: "To be or not to be, mm. that is the question." Uh, or in his case, "To sign or not to sign, that yeah. is the question." And of course, it um, it's it's I, I think it's a dilemma for him because he's going from uh, an organisation that he's in control of, really at Salford, with players who he's signed who play his sort of game. Um, He's then being asked to go into a different organisation with a completely different set of players, none of whom he's signed, none of whom he probably knows particularly well. Um, And, you know, he's going to be expected to turn them round and to perform miracles. Well, you know, I just don't think that's possible. Um, I think Hull are in such a poor state that I don't think anybody can turn them around immediately. It's mm. it's a very long-term project. And if I were Paul Rowley uh, and Hull did want me to go to Hull, I think I would wait until next season. I, you know, complete the season with Salford would be my advice. And then... Um, you know, if he's if he's going to move, and if there's a transfer fee involved, go at that point. Mm. Um, the the thing that makes me think that he might go earlier um, is because Salford always need money. Mm. You know, one hundred and fifty thousand for Salford will pay off a lot of um, you know pay off a lot of debts, I suppose, and they may feel compelled to let him go. Um, in that case, I'm not sure who would take over from him at. Uh, at, at the Red Devils, and I'd be I'd be so sorry to see him go because I love watching the way that they play at Salford, and his influence is such a major part of it. And you know, I love his. I, I, I actually think he's a very very intelligent, very smart guy. Um, he um, he's good to talk to, and uh, he's also very incisive. If you ever see him uh, on TV as a pundit, uh, he's also very you know he's got a very perceptive way of talking about the game so um you know i'd like to see him stay at salford some somebody's surely at some point somebody has got to come in at salford and and you know put a lot of money into that club because i'm quite certain that if they do they'll get a big return on it um i think that club has got the potential to be so much bigger than it is Mm. and could challenge all the other top teams in, in in super league and uh Somehow they've got to find a way to attract that sort of investment. I wonder if that's um, part of the reason why he would be attracted to leave, um, given... You well, know, you don't know what the investment dramas. is at Hull FC, because, I mean, Adam Pearson, the um, the owner, has been saying, you know, for quite a long time that they ne- desperately need more investment at Hull. Mm. So, you know, there is some talk of um, investment possibly coming, Um and if I were Paul Rowley, I'd certainly want to know a lot more about that before mm. I agreed to sign. They they need to be able to sign top players again if if they're going to be successful in the long term. Mm. And is that going to happen? Who knows? You think uh, if he was to leave Salford, that would significantly set them back? Oh, I, I think it would do. Of course it would. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Of course it would. I'm not quite sure. You know what uh, what would happen. 
to them. But you know, we'll we'll see. No doubt that story will develop over the next few mm. days. It seems like a few uh, Salford fans are starting to get frustrated with the club. Obviously, we had um, the Tyler Dupree, uh, Brody Croft, um, Andy Ackers uh, all left, and now. Well, would you uh, rather have? I mean, I could understand that completely. But would you rather have a club without those players or a club growing, going broke with those players? Mm. You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, um, sometimes if you're running a club, you've got to manage the financial situation very carefully if you've got no access to funding. And the only way to do that, really, is to sell players or, in this case, to sell coaches. Mm. So I can completely understand any Salford fans feeling unhappy. But... You know, at at, at the end of the day, what the club needs to do is to find somebody who can make that investment, who will um, turn the club around financially in the same way that, you know, it's been turned around on the field by a succession of coaches, you know, by Ian Watson first and now Paul Rowley. Well, how about we head down and get a lotto ticket after this podcast, Martin, you and I will split one and then if we we win, we'll go by Salford. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've also had uh, a lot of other transfer news over the last week or so. Um, one of the big ones, Ryan Hall, uh, returning to Leeds from next season. At the uh, age of 37. Yeah. I mean, Ryan Hall's an incredible guy. Um, you know, he's, 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 he's a great player. Um, he, despite his age, he still looks as though he could take anybody on. Mm. Um, and he's a very intelligent guy as well, very smart in, in several ways. Um, and it looks it looks as though Leeds have uh, offered him um, a role at Headingley going beyond his playing career. So that's obviously a, a big attraction. And, and I, think, I think Ryan Hall is the sort of guy who will make a success of probably anything he does. I'd be amazed if he wasn't very successful in some field after playing rugby mm-hmm. league and uh you know leeds if it's at headingley that's that's marvelous isn't it that's mm-hmm. great for leeds so uh although uh, inevitably a few people have raised eyebrows at leeds signing a player who's going to be that old mm-hmm. at the start of next season all i can say well i would say two things to that a i wish i was that old um <laughs> and b um i think it does make a lot of sense if you look at it through a long term lens. Yeah. And and you know, good for Leeds that they've that they've done that. And we often talk on this podcast about how great it is for a club just to bring in someone with experience, that mm. leadership, just a senior voice in the locker room. Well he certainly will be that, won't he? Mm. And uh he'll be a great mentor for the the young uh, outside backs coming mm. through. So uh, I think it's a great signing for Leeds. Um another uh signing, Tex Hoy. Uh, he's signed with Castleford for the remainder of the season. Um, well, it's interesting, isn't it, that Tex Hoy and, and New Brown both left Hull just probably two weeks ago now. Um, New Brown played for the St. George Illawarra Dragons at the weekend on Friday and uh, only played 18 minutes, but it just shows how people rate him over there, that as soon as he left Hull, the Dragons pounced mm. and put him straight into their match day squad, you yeah. know, and he certainly didn't let them down when he got onto the pitch. Mm. So that's quite interesting. And Tex Hoy, I mean, a lot of people have said, well, Tex Hoy was disappointing at Hull, but, you know, the only times I've seen him play for Hull, and I've not seen all their games, so, uh, you know, he may well have had some bad games. Yeah. But certainly I thought when they played Lee a few weeks ago, he was the, probably the best Hull player on the pitch. Mm. And I thought you could see his frustration that things were were going so badly. So I, th- I, I I rate him quite highly as a player. He was the understudy to Kaling Ponga at Newcastle Knights. And I think he'll do a good job for Castleford. You know, I think um, I think he'll fit straight into their squad. And, uh, you know, Castleford are making, I think, some quite decent signings. You know, not maybe right at top-level signings, which they probably can't afford. But they're making some quite good signings that are strengthening their squad. Mm. And he'll be uh, hungry to silence some of those doubters and oh, some of the stuff he's yeah, heard in you? the media. And he's yeah. still a, a very young player. So, uh, Not much surfing in Castleford, though, is there? Because he's, uh, <laughs> his dad is a surfing champion, Matt yeah. Hoy, and uh, no doubt Tex is a surfer as well, But uh, mm. which he could do in Newcastle, but not... Uh, not unfortunately in um, in in Castleford, although he probably didn't do any in Hull either. Yeah, yeah. So you know, but yeah. that's uh, 
He'll have to wait for that. He'll need to go to one of those big wave simulators Absolutely. where they do those artificial waves, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, too bloody cold to be getting out in the water at, at this stage, I think they probably mate. just want to escape the, the big um, leisure centre, just, just glass out and neck, just very, which is part of Castleford. So maybe okay. you can do that. Yeah, more more uh, chance of going snowboarding over here than uh, surfing, yeah, I reckon. Yeah. Um, oh. Now, what other uh, transfer news we have here? Uh, we spoke about the uh, Jack Broadbent uh, move. Um, Josh Drinkwater reportedly uh, set to seek out an opportunity at another club. Uh, where yes. do you reckon he ends up? Well, he's obviously, um, you know, th- th- they've got Leon Hayes there now coming through, haven't they? And he's mm. been hogging the first team. Um, plays partnering George Williams and it looks to be working well this year so maybe there isn't a place anymore for Josh at Warrington next year mm. um, I don't know maybe maybe that's what Hull need um, we've talked about this before haven't we that um, Hull need a, a halfback who can you know take them around the field a bit they're, they're waiting for Jake Truman to come back maybe a partnership between Drinkwater and Truman would be a good one who knows and, and would be the start of their sort of gradual rehabilitation. Hmm. Um, I don't know whether that whether the whole rate drink water or not. I don't know, but Josh has been all around really, and he also had a spell at Hull KR. So you know he's he's he's, he's, he's done the rounds a bit, but um, you know he's, he's he's not the best half back, but he's not the worst either, hmm. and he's got a very good kicking game. So you know we'll we'll just have to see what. What happens there? As much as I'd love to see him heading down to London, I don't think it's going to happen for you, uh, you know so. the rest of the season. No. So um, now we've also had the uh, England versus uh, France clash uh, scheduled for June 29 at uh, Toulouse, I believe. Um, good to see this one finally set in stone, so we have some certainty around it. Thank goodness, yes, yeah. yes. And actually, what we're all hoping is that the um, French give us a game this this year. You know, last mm. year. It was 64 nil. Both men and women, actually, 64 nil. Well, that's just not very, you know, that's just not good for either us or them. Mm. Um, we, you know, they need to try to get within, you know, 10 or 20 points of us, I suppose. And um, and they've got some good players coming through the French. You know, you, it, they, they really have. I mean, it's interesting. We were talking about London a few minutes ago, and it was interesting, interesting to see that they had the young Hugo Tisson who's on loan from Catalan's Dragons, and he was stepping in at dummy half and, and looked quite effective. You know, that, uh, you know, the Catalans do have some really good young French players just, just on the verge of coming through, but the, the only trouble is we're always saying that, and, mm. we, you know, they do need to come through in greater numbers and actually, you know, take control of, 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 of the Catalan side, and similarly at Toulouse as well. Mm. You know, we, we, we need both the French clubs to be developing French talent, don't we? Mm. And it's caused a few dramas for the championship because I believe that falls on the same day as the Toulouse. Uh, Toulouse and Feathers is going to kick off late in the evening. Yeah, so yeah. you'd imagine there'd be a few players from Toulouse that'll be picked in that uh, side for France. You'd imagine um, so, but Featherson won't complain about that, will they? No. So, And that's a, that's a, a match-up, I'm sure, a lot of people. Uh, excited to watch so oh, yeah, yeah. yeah a bit disappointing there and um, I'm sure they'll field a team they'll be able to pull from some of their younger players but mm, uh, mm. yeah hopefully they can keep it competitive but um, another thing I want to touch on with you Martin you wrote an article uh, in this week's edition of League Express uh, paper talking about restoring the Challenge Cup magic you've got yes. a few um, suggestions oh loads yeah I mean the Challenge Cup it it it, it, it it really upsets me to see the decline of the Challenge Cup because it's been such a great competition throughout Rugby League's history since 1897, in fact, and uh, when the first Challenge Cup final was played at Headingley and Batley beat St Helens. Mm. Um, in recent, ever since we moved to switch the, the, switch the season to summer, the Challenge Cup has, you know, it, the, the RFL hasn't really known what to do with the Challenge Cup, and they, they didn't. It, it's always been. It's always been a competition that climaxes at Wembley and that climaxes at the end of the season. And, you know, for for IMG to come and recommend playing it early in the season with a Challenge Cup final in June, as it's going to be this year, I think it's just nuts, personally. I just They don't understand the history of our sport, and clearly they don't. Um, so, you know, what's, what's, what's really vital for the Challenge Cup... It, it, in, in the old days, as I, I made the point in last week's League Express, in the old days, 
It used to begin in, when we had a season from August to mid-May, the Challenge Cup used to begin in February. And it, it used to, you know, be played every two weeks, you know, up to the final, so to speak, or a, bi a bigger gap between the semis and the final. But, you know, the early rounds played every two weeks. And people, it, it, it gave an opportunity to clubs that hadn't succeeded so far, you know, after six months of, of league fixtures. They had a second major trophy to go for. And the fans were really excited by it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, y your club might be in 10th place in the league, not likely to make the top four, which it was in those days, top four playoff. But you could have another go and try and win the Challenge Cup. And people were so excited by it. And it, it climaxed um, at the end of the season. The, 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 the old Championship final and Challenge Cup final were on successive Saturdays. And it was just a great climax to the season. And we need to bring that back again and, you know, bring some other elements back again that that will make for a really big day out at Wembley in the Challenge Cup final. And uh, I've, I've suggested various, various things. For example, I think we ought to be having a, a video. All, all, all the great rugby league players who have died in the last few months, you know, you've got Lewis Jones, Phil Lowe, lots of others, you know, let's have a video tribute at the Challenge Cup final to, to, to players like that who have graced our sport. Mm. Let's, let's give them a proper tribute. Let's, you know, let's announce things like, you know, uh, new players inducted into the Hall of Fame. You know, let's have the teams from 25 years earlier forming a guard of honour for the teams as they come out on the pitch. There's so much that could be done to really bring back a sense of, you know, occasion for the Challenge Cup. Let, and, and let's go back to having 32 teams in the in the first round, including the Super League teams, and play it, you know. So let's, let's give the lower teams a chance to, you know, compete against the big ones. They probably won't win, of course. Mm. But, but we, we saw with the FA Cup semi-final at the weekend, Coventry playing Manchester United and nearly beating them. Mm. You know, the, the, there's a lot of romance in a smaller team playing a bigger team. And I've also suggested the other element that's probably a bit more controversial is limiting the number of um, overseas quota players uh, round by round. So that in the first round, although teams are allowed to have seven quota players in total, for the first round, make it just three, and then four, five, six, and seven for the final. So that, and people said, well, why have you suggested that? Well, there are two reasons. One is because by doing that, it, it will even up a bit the first round of the competition when Super League clubs may be playing clubs outside Super League. But probably even more important we need to give the Challenge Cup a, a, a unique identity that allows, you know, people to talk about it in a different way to Super League or the Championship or League One. And can you imagine if, let's say, let, let's imagine the first round of the Challenge Cup was due to start in July and teams are only, only, only allowed to play three of their overseas quota. You'd have loads of... Um, You'd have Brian Carney on Sky, for example, with his, all his pundits discussing which three should be selected for each club, which three are each club going to select. You'd have people like me writing newspaper articles about it. You'd get people talking about the Cup, and that's the key thing. You, you, you've got to get people talking about the Cup and debating among themselves You know how, the, how their clubs are going to perform, who they're going to select, and all, all that sort of stuff. And mm. we've got to... We've got to <coughs> You know, at the moment, you know, fans switch off when the Cup rounds come around. I know we've got two great-looking semi-finals this year and hopefully a great final, but mm. we need to have that level of interest right from the start, not just at semi-final time. Mm. We need to regenerate big crowds again. And, um, you know, my suggestions, I think, would go a long way to doing that. But And if anybody's got any better suggestions, please let us know. Mm. Yeah, let us know in the comments. I was just going to um, chime in there with the... 
three quota spots, what you could do is then make it a requirement that the three players coming in are all debutants or you know academy graduates um, in the you, club you system. Know, there's all sorts, but you you know the, 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 there's all sorts that you could do. But as I say, the key thing is to get people talking and debating about the cup again. Mm, yeah. That's that's the point. And um, you know, let's 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 get to the point, for example, where in round one, uh, the, which is you know the round of thirty two. You've got just as much chance of having Wigan drawn against St Helens as you have of Cornwall being drawn against the Midlands Hurricanes or something. Because that's the nature of the cup, isn't it? Mm. <clears throat> you know, the big teams can be drawn against each other, and so can the little teams. Or, m- more likely, big teams can be drawn against little teams. And people who might say, well, you'd have some one-sided games. But actually, not that many. Because I- I've suggested that, um, you know, the... the um, only the top eight League One teams would 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 take part, and you'd only have on a if if you do a probability analysis of it, you'd probably have three games between Super League clubs and League One clubs. Well, I'm sure that we could tolerate that, couldn't we? Mm, you, yeah. you probably would get some one-sided scores mm. in round one. But the compensating thing is that that if a Super League club visited a League One club, they'd get a damn good gate. And and it would be great. You know, the Super League fans would get the chance to go to places like Midlands Hurricanes or Cornwall or even, you know, Keithley or whoever, whoever, whichever clubs are in League One, you know, venues that they don't often go to. Mm. And again, that was the great charm of the Cup. I remember as a kid going to grounds in Lancashire that we otherwise wouldn't visit, you know, for, for cup games. Mm. And it, it, it just added to the sort of drama and and spell that the Challenge Cup had over fans. And we've got to somehow revive that, I think. Bring it back, yeah. No, all great suggestions, mate. And, uh, yeah, we welcome our listeners to, you know, give their suggestions in Absolutely, the uh, comment yeah. section. Um, just one more uh, transfer that's, well, reported uh, transfer that's uh, come through this morning, mate. Uh, there's been reports of a swap deal between Lee and Hull FC, uh, Tom Briscoe for uh, Darnell McIntosh. So. Well, interestingly, yeah, that's, that's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, Tom Briscoe is getting well into his 30s now, and they've, at Lee, they've got Amala Hanley playing very well, I think, on, on, on the wing since Tom's been injured. Hmm. Um, and it looks as though the future belongs to Amila Hanley in that position at, uh, at Lee. So it's not too surprising that, uh, that Tom might head back to, to Hull. Daniel McIntosh going the other way? Well, you know, that's, um, uh, again, Darnell is still quite a young player, and clearly they think that they can... Um, you know, use him at, at Lee and, uh, you know, good luck to him if, if that swap deal goes through. It's an interesting one. Mm, no, definitely. Uh, now, some of the NRL news. Um, Cronulla Sharks forward, Dale Finucan. Uh, he's retiring with immediate effect uh, following some uh, medical advice. He's had a few repeated concussions now. Uh, he mm. saw a couple of specialists. They've all told him he should uh, retire from uh, playing He's had a long league. career, hasn't he? 13 years, I think. Yes, yeah, so, and uh, all played through the middle of the field. So, um, yeah. you know, he's seen some uh some contact that's for sure yeah uh, but yeah sad to see him leave but he's got a, a had a decorated career and oh um, yes every but you know retirement comes to every player doesn't it, and it mm. when people start saying that your health could be impacted if you carry on playing mm. then that's probably the time to go isn't it yeah let's face it and hopefully he'll have a, a long and happy and very healthy retirement no absolutely and uh i'm sure he'll stay involved with the game in one way or another whether it be coaching I'm or sure, um, yes. yeah so um yeah I think he will do it at Cronulla, won't he? Mm, yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, now we have uh, a bit of news. Caelan Ponga looks like he could miss a big chunk of the season. He's done oh, a Liz Frank yes. injury to his foot, which is uh, a shame for Newcastle, but it could open up an opportunity for Will Price. Just what I was going to say, yes, yes, yes. Great minds think alike. Yeah, yeah and I noticed that Will is down in the 21-man squad this week to, um, you know, to, 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 to play... Um, for the Knights, but I don't think he's down in the 17 players who probably will take to the field. Mm. So, But, he, you know, he's edging closer and he's been playing quite well for their reserve grade side. So hopefully um, hopefully we're going to see him soon. And, of course, mm. Kai Pierce-Paul has been in there all along, hasn't he? So, you know, there's been no problem with with him. They, they, they play at the Dolphins 
um, this week to Newcastle. So things are getting no easier for them, are they? Mm. And the Dolphins are playing some really good rugby at the moment. They're looking great, aren't yeah. they? Um, yeah. Obviously, over the weekend, they, they had a few troops out. We got to see uh, young Trey Fuller yeah, uh, yeah. playing at fullback. I'm at Parramatta. My gosh, Parramatta, yeah. they... You know, Brad Arthur, uh, their coach, looks to me to be in trouble, to mm. be honest. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, that will be interesting to see if anybody, you know, if they do make a move on him, and, and if so, who would take mm. over? Well, they'll play in that game up in Darwin, which is, uh, you know, incredibly warm uh, climate. I don't think I'd like to be playing rugby league no, it's up there. It's even warmer than in Brighouse, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, oh, but, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I was sort of just watching Trey Fuller perform. He scored two tries. They had to get an exemption to get him um, inside or to allow him to play because he wasn't in their 30-man squad. Um, and, yeah, he scored two tries. Um, great, yeah, great young star. got to share the field with Trey a few times um, when I was about 16, 17 years old playing in high school. Right. Uh, he attended St. Brendan's College up in Yapoon um, and came back when he wasn't playing representative football uh, to play club football on the weekend. And our first match together, he scored three tries, um, playing at fullback, running like a front rower. Yeah. Um, yeah, 10 metres out from the line and... Yeah, we always knew that he was a freakish player, but it's great to see him finally getting a shot. Were you a freakish player as well, Jake? Oh, I wouldn't say freakish, No, mate. no, no, right. <laughs> I'm sure you're a good one. Though. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you might have talked to a few of my former coaches. Yes. They might say otherwise, mate. Yeah. But, um, yeah, he was a, a, an incredible talent. And the one thing against him has always been, oh, you know, he, is, he, is he big enough? It's his size. But, yeah, today's day and age, you know, you, all you got to do is have a bit of heart. And, uh, he Absolutely, has plenty of it. yes. And, yeah, um, couldn't agree more. But yeah, great to see him doing well. But we'll move on to um, this weekend's matchups to get your quick picks, mate. We've got a Thursday night match this week, I believe, which is great. Um, Saints versus Huddersfield. Who do you like in that one? Well, you, you've got to go for Saints. Um, but Huddersfield, you know, if they play like they have been doing, they'll give them a very a very tight game. And, mm. um, you know, it's a, da- it's a dangerous game for Saints, this one, because, you know, Huddersfield could shock them as they, as they shocked Catalans. And... Huddersfield have played all these away games and, you know, they're playing really well away from home. They've played hardly any at home. Mm. And they're, they're a very able side. That You know, things are coming together for them. So I think Saints will win, but it won't be easy. And uh, I'd say by about six. Yeah. And uh, then we've got uh, Lee taking on Catalans at, uh, on Friday night. Well, I think Lee will edge this game. Uh, I think the crucial player for them who's come back into action is Tom Amone. Um, you know, who had a, a a really great game against Warrington, I thought. Mm. Um, and I, I think L- Lee are pretty desperate, aren't they? And um, I think I think that desperation will translate into effort and commitment on uh, you know the weekend. And I, I think they might just edge this game by probably a similar margin, six points or so. Won't be easy, but. I think they'll pull it off. Yeah, it'll be a statement win for them, that's for it sure. Would. There's no doubt about it. And we've got uh, Hull KR taking on Wigan. Oh, gosh, again, uh, you know, I, I can't... Um, I, I, again, I'm, I'm not sure whether Michael Lewis will be playing in this game, and if he isn't, I think I would back Wigan by about 10 points. Mm. I think Wigan... I mean, the, you know, Wigan are just the, the best team in the competition, aren't they, at the moment? And um, I can't easily see anybody else beating them. Yeah, just watching some of the tries Bevan French is scoring. At times oh, he looks gosh. like, you know, he's a, a, a player you cre- create on a video game, you know. Absolutely, some yeah, of his skills yeah. is yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Brilliant. Uh, then we have Cass taking on London. Well, you've got to say that um, this, on the face of it, looks like an opportunity for London, but I can't see Cass throwing this one away. I, I think they could win by quite a good margin of about 20 points. Mm. I think Castleford, Castleford are slowly improving and i think they will improve enough to be able to really use this game as 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 a means to you know take one step forward really it's a shame um london couldn't attract tex hoy down there obviously he'll be you expect him to play for cast they tried for him yes uh and on on saturday we've got salford taking on warrington well i can only see warrington winning this game um but you never know. I mean, Salford often do do very well against Warrington. They've got a record of, of good results against them. But um, I think the way Warrington are playing at the moment, I see them as, you know, the, the main challenger to Wigan and Saints. And I think they might just be a bit too good. But again, by probably about 10 points to, to win at Salford. 
Mm. And then the final matchup of the weekend, Hull FC taking on Leeds uh, on Sunday. Well, this is a great chance for Leeds to get back on the horse, isn't it? And to <clears throat> start putting it together and, 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 and get another win. And you just can't see that not happening. I mean, I know Leeds have been inconsistent, but nothing like as inconsistent as... Well, Hull have not been inconsistent, actually. Mm. They've just been consistently bad, haven't they? And mm. um, I can't see Leeds not winning this game. Yep, and uh, well, that pretty much wraps up uh, everything this week, mate. Anything else you'd like to touch on before we... No, I think we've touched on quite a bit, haven't we? And, um, you know, it's been an interesting uh, weekend of action. It looks like being another interesting weekend of action this weekend. And, mm. uh, you know, let's let's hope that it's um, as exciting as we've seen it in recent weeks, and I'm sure it will be, and uh, some, you know... Uh, I still can't manage to catch up and watch every game on TV, unfortunately, but it would be nice to be able to do that, wouldn't it? Mm, no, especially with uh, the NRL games also, trying to, to watch Absolutely. a few of those as well. It's, it's a tough ask. Um, well, I think the the, the, the big um, Anzac Day game will be um, shown on British TV, won't it, um, between Melbourne and South Sydney. So I think that'll be worth watching on Thursday morning. Mm, oh, definitely. All right, mate. We'll, um, we will remind our listeners and viewers, um, don't forget to hit subscribe on YouTube. Um, if you do want to grab yourself a copy of the online uh, League Express or Rugby League World magazine, um, head along to totalrl.com forward slash shop. Yes, and this was the front page this week. Uh, Huddersfield Giants front page on the march, which mm. uh, undoubtedly they do seem to be. And... Uh, Great for them. They don't often feature on the front page to Huddersfield, but it's great to see that they that they are doing. Although I'm not mad about that strip that they, that sort of odd green coloured strip that they use as their away strip. Mm. Nonetheless, um, you can't deny them when they're playing so well, can you? No, absolutely right. And uh, let's hope their form continues to make it interesting uh, in the back end of the season. Yeah. Um, all right, mate. Just one final thing before we go. Um, we won't talk about it yet, maybe next week, but the Women's Super League started at the weekend and great win for York Valkyrie against St. Helens. At, uh, that was the, the standout score, I think. So good luck to them. And they even then set the template for the York Knights to beat Bradford Bulls for their first win of the season. So just a, a nod to um, Rugby League outside Super League, Jake. Mm, no, definitely. And uh, we will try and focus a bit more on the, the Women's we Super will. League going forward, mate. Um, all right, well, we'll wrap it up here and do it all again next week, mate. That's great. And thanks for coming. And uh, best of wishes to all our listeners and watchers. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Cheers.